Well, good to see everybody. Appreciate you that are visiting and return visitors. Uh, we just uh, just got back from North Carolina Tuesday, uh, doing my helping with my father-in-law's funeral. And there's a lot lot of pressure. I wanted to want to do a good job, and uh, we did. Everybody did. Uh, Kathy's brother and yeah, myself and the pastor. I uh, did a really good job, I thought, of, of getting the word out, witnessing the people, and, and uh, uh, showing respect to, uh, to my father-in-law. And uh, I, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, it's something when, uh, when you see people just laying there and they're suffering. I think he'd been in a nursing home for four years, wasn't he, Kathy? And Kathy had talked to him on the phone and a uh, few days before he died and said, Dad, said, Mom's all dressed up waiting for you in heaven. So you just need to go on and go, go and uh, be uh, with her. And uh, I promise you, he's not complaining. And none of our loved ones that know the Lord are complaining. So um, I'm glad God handles that. Anyway, glad you're here. And... Uh, it's good to be home. Ellensburg is, is home, and I miss church here, and I miss you. And uh, Janine, I just want to say to you, I, I, and, and I mean this sincerely, I need to borrow $60,000 <laughs> to buy some land, so talk to your daughter. I can, I can pay it back. Also, I got three feral cats. <laughs> Where is she? Somebody text Anita. She's out of town. Of course she is. But we've had some open doors since we've been back. We've got some folks I believe will come to church that we witnessed to. So uh, I, I want to read a verse in, in, in Psalm 122. Psalm 122. And there's so many verses, uh, you know, I could use for this uh, message today. But I like this, Psalm 122 and verse 1. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Heavenly Father, bless your word. You receive all the honor and glory. We're glad we can have a good time in your house. Help us, God, to see what this time is about, what we're doing right now, and uh, what we hope to do. And you have a design for the church. You have a design for worship that we need to follow that will, will make us glad when we go into the house of the Lord. We ask your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Israel worship in, in a tabernacle, uh, a big tent. And as they traveled, they would set that up, and every bit of it was symbolic. And it's interesting. Uh, if you've never heard messages on the tabernacle, it's, it's uh, great messages, the furnishings, the, the labor, the, how they offered the sacrifice, the holy of holies that only the the high priest could enter in. And you know, they would tie a rope around him and uh, they had bells on him. And if he had sin in his life and he dared to go into the Holy of Holies, God would take him out. And I, I don't know if there's any instance of that in the Bible, uh, but uh, there's a possibility. And, they, and they, you know, God, you had to be, he had to be confessed up. You don't have to be sinless but you have to be confessed up, amen? And trying to walk with God. And uh, thank God he won't do that now. If you see me up here with a rope around me and bells, you know, I'm about to be drug out because I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. But I want to talk about this, what a successful church should be. What are we trying to accomplish there's a lot of folks that come to church, and there's nothing wrong with that if it's done the right way, but uh, they, they, you know, have a business, and so they'll go to a 
usually a larger church and maybe meet some people and enhance their business. And I guess you could do, uh, I guess you could do both uh, if it's if you put God first. Uh, but uh, the church is, it has some specific ideas. Jesus had mentioned, "I will build my church; the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." That is, the gates of hell are not outside of this arena. The gates of hell is where we venture into. In war, we are attacking the strongholds of Satan. Uh, I, I, I don't think we really know. I don't think most churches know what success is. Uh, it would be great. I'm all for having a big church. I'm all for having as many people as we can get to come. But uh, the, the size of the church really does not, uh, is not the criteria. God is more concerned about quality than he is quantity. Now, if you, I've been in big churches, and my, my our oldest son, at least he was, he may have found another one, was going to the largest Southern Baptist church, probably the largest Baptist church in the United States. My wife visited there, and it's humongous. And it's uh, they've got thousands of people, and it's run really well. And uh, they do things that all of our churches should do as far as trying to make people feel welcome, reaching out to people. But you can have a big church and have the Spirit of God, or you can have a small church and have the Spirit of God. We need to understand, are we doing what God wants us to do this morning? Are we receiving what God wants us to receive today? What is he doing? Well, you know, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name there I'll be in the midst. Now that doesn't mean you have to be small to have God there, but it says even if you have two or three, I'll be there. I submit to you that the Holy Spirit, God is here in two ways. He's here in every believer, but he's here in this building and every gospel preaching building uh, where people are meeting. He's there in two ways. He's there uh, in the person of the believer, and he's there in a general sense. And I kind of like that. I like that God is with us. In the, and, of course, the uh, Old Testament, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. That's why David was really wanted to get that, uh, get that Ark of the Covenant back. And it's just a big, like a hope chest. And I think in that was Aaron's rod that budded, uh, the, the pot of manna, and what else was it? There's one other thing, that, the law. Yeah, the, the table of the tablet of the law was in that. And we know where that's at now. Art mentioned that a couple Sundays ago. It is in the Army Warehouse in Washington, D.C. And that was... Depicted on uh, what what show was it? Raiders of the Lost Raiders of the Lost Lost Ark. You can actually watch that and see where that's at. But um, I want to get what I can get out of this. You know, people go to. I like music, but I, I would. I've only been to one, maybe two concerts. You know, in my life, whatever they're calling them now. And uh, I don't like being in a huge crowd of people unless I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> but I don't like being in a huge crowd of people. Some people love that atmosphere, but I, I like good music. I like the same music that I might hear in a concert that's uh, really good, but I'd like to hear it privately, you know, like better quality. <laughs> and and uh, I, I like that. So... I want to be where God's at. What does God, now I've been doing this for 40 years I've been in church. Most of what I've learned, I've learned the hard way. What does it work? And there's a lot of things we do without thinking about it. Now, and now I want us to think about it today, that there's something going on right here. It doesn't matter how great the preacher is. It doesn't matter how uh, attractive he is. I understand I, <laughs> I have that problem, but I, I try to get people to focus on the Word of God, not my good looks. So, uh, 
God has something for you today that will make you glad. How many like to hunt? Some people like to hunt. Some people like to fish. Makes them glad. That's a good feeling, isn't it? When, you, when you're doing something you enjoy doing and you get out in the woods or you're by the lake and you're fishing, uh, if you enjoy that sort of thing, and it's, it makes you glad. Just being in that atmosphere. Camping, stuff like that, makes you glad. Enjoy it. And so uh, God wants us to be glad. You can get a kind of gladness here, the kind that you can't get anywhere else. It's not like a concert. It's not like a club. It's not like a group of people meeting for, for a hobby or any other things, though that might be fun. This is a place of pure, true gladness. It's a reminder of where we're going. And by the way, we need to get along down here because... Uh, because we're going to the same heaven, if you're saved. We're going to the same heaven. But the good thing is people that I don't necessarily get along with or like their attitude, when we get to heaven, they're going to be like me. <laughs> they'll have their glorified body and they'll be perfect. Mary Beth, like I am. And so that's, that's humor for you that are visiting. I don't feel that way, but I think it's funny to say that. So what should a successful church be doing? How do we know? I've said this. I came to this realization a few years ago, uh, battling the frustration of trying to bring God and have a spirit of God on me and reaching the lost. And with the opposition of sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and it look, if you look at it, you think, man, well, how can we win? I mean, we're battling our own flesh, our greatest enemy. We're battling the devil. We're battling the world, which is totally trying to undo what we're trying to do. But then I came to the realization uh, of this statement, God rules in the chaos. Amen. That made me glad when I figured that out. It can be chaotic all around us. It doesn't slow God down one bit. He, I think he prefers to work in the chaos. He does things in the darkness. He can reach any person, any place. I was talking to, I went to our home church back in North Carolina a Sunday night. I was talking to the pastor's youngest son there, and he's like 20-something now. I remember when he was that big. Uh, me and him went out witnessing, and uh, uh, he he was uh, telling me how you know how he had gotten saved, and he said I thought I'd got saved as a kid, and he said I really uh, came to the realization I wasn't saved, and he said I didn't want to say anything until I was 100% sure because you you know you see people make professions over and over. But if that's what it takes, that's fine. And if somebody says, you know, I, I'm doubting my salvation, I'm going to try to show them. I'm saying, did you do this? And some people are weak in that area. And so uh, I said, you know, the only advantage of being in absolute darkness and getting saved is you don't really doubt your salvation so much. I doubt my service, but I don't doubt my salvation because not that I'm, I'm, I'm some great Christian, but man, I was, I was in a dark place, a dark place. And a, and a young person that saved in church, brought, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, but people that brought up in a Christian home, it's hard for them to see the difference. But it's an advantage not to have that testimony of horror <laughs> and sin in your life. So we need to be sympathetic to that. So what, what does it mean uh, when we come to the house of God? What is our expectation? I've, I've met people in my life that said, you know, I want to be fed. I want to be fed. And I say, hey, man, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? When you get fed the word of God, God expects you to work. You know why we get so big? When I say we, I'm talking about me. 
I ate. Anybody know what a foot long hot dog is? I love them. North Carolina, it's the only thing I miss from the South. And I ate the biggest, almost three foot long hot dogs. I could have ate another half of one. <laughs> Kathy took a bite off of hers. I ate three foot longs. The next day, I ate two foot longs and a barbecue sandwich. The first one I ate, I teared up. It, it was an emotional experience. Getting to eat a hot dog again. That vinegar based slaw and that perfect chili. And oh my Lord. And then we went out with her brother. Anyway, I ate three hot dogs uh, on the way home uh, going to uh, her dad's house where we stayed. We met her brother there and I said, Kathy said, hey, John just had three foot long hot dogs. He said, I see that. <laughs> so the difference today is we don't work physically a lot of work. We don't work like we used to. And when we had to work, when we had to chop wood, uh, when we had to work out in the garden, we had to move rocks, uh, then we would, we would burn some energy and we weren't quite as big, but now we, a lot of us look like Jay. A lot of us look like Jay. So the thing is, if you, you know, people say, I'm just, I'm not getting fed. I'm not enjoying the Christian life. Put something into it. What else in life do you enjoy that you don't put anything into it? Nothing. You got you to gotta invest yourself in something for you to really enjoy it. And, and until we start sacrificing, oh, what, a, what an amazing, profound, new revelation. Sacrifice. Give something of yourself. To God, do something for other people and, uh, and do it in the name of God. Number one, what we should be doing in a church, and, and the, the, when I first said it, it's going to sound weird. I said this a few years ago. We need turnover. We need turnover. We need people coming in church all the time. Jesus had turnover, and it should bother us. We shouldn't like it. But we should understand that Jesus said to a group of his followers, will you, all, will you, will you also go away? Because people had left him. You know how miserable we would be if we were set at the feet of Jesus as a disciple? They got rebuked constantly by the coach. That's what a coach doesn't always tell you what you're doing good, does he, James? He tells you what you're doing wrong so you can be better. No, don't do that. Do it like this. And so Jesus is trying to correct us. And when we get self-satisfied, we think we're doing great. We're not going to be glad when we come into the house of the Lord. You see, the Word of God will perform what God sent it out to do. Amen. It, will, it will either have repel people or it will receive people. But there's a line, there's a change that comes when people hear the gospel. I, I've had a few people lately that didn't want to think about God, had nothing to do with God, but I got them in a, I invaded their bubble. <laughs> and I give them the gospel. And they thought, well, that's nice. I won't respond to that. Nothing has changed. Everything has changed. When you hear the gospel, you either reject it or receive it, and there's nothing new that you can do to trick God. <laughs> there's nothing you can do to trick God. You can't get over on God. A lot of people like to deceive people. You can't deceive God. And one or two things are going to happen when the gospel goes out. You're going to say yes or no. You can't say maybe. You, later means what? No. So uh, I tell you, I love that story of the sower. I, I, I'm trying to become a sower as a lifestyle, not just a witness. The sower went forth to sow, and he sowed the gospel seed everywhere. 
He sowed it on stony ground. We wouldn't do that. He sowed it on uh, thorns and briars. He sowed it on the beaten path. He sowed the seed in fertile soil. And the Bible says some of it sprang up. Some of it sprang up but never bore fruit. That is, it made a reaction, and we've all seen that. And by and by, people that do not get truly saved and can only fake it for so long. They'll come up with an excuse. Something will happen. They'll say, no, no, I don't like this. I don't. And you know what? I, I'm going to reject it all. There's a turnover. We need to be given the gospel out, sowing the seed. And it took me years to figure this out. The, the soil is the hearts of me, and I knew that, but it's always changing. That's why we go through. God is a genius. He is a genius. As I get older, I'm 39 now, but as I get older, 69, yeah, that's right, I begin to realize more and more how smart God is. Because you might, I got saved when I was 26, you might be reachable at, in your 20s at, or as a child and not be reachable at other stages and somewhere along the line. You know, we get older, we get vulnerable, don't we? Start falling down. We start having uh, ailments. We start falling apart, and I think art is a classic example of that. We start falling apart. And we wonder what's going on. That's God speaking to us. Hey, guys, you got to go to the bathroom? No. Okay. Come on in. You need some coffee? No. Okay, it's in the back. We start going through things, and, uh, and then we think, hey, I'm kind of weak. I'm going to die one day. We figure it out. When you're in your 20s, you don't believe you're going to die. By the way, you do. They do. People die, all go out in the graveyard, and they're all different ages. We don't know what should be on the morrow. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time that vanisheth away. So there's categories of the sower. So you just sow. He's not worried about the ground. He just sows it. If you hesitate and you think, well, this guy won't get saved, I won't witness to him. Why do we get so happy when we go to witness and we find out somebody's already saved? Because we don't have we don't, with me, I don't have to go through that whole uh, battle with them. Get the word out. Get, it'll enhance your heaven. We'll be laying up treasures in heaven. It's the only currency that's going to count. We gotta have turn up. We ought to be having lost people come in all the time. New people coming in all the time in our lives, in our church, so we can try to reach them. They may not get saved. Oh, hallelujah. We went to the, the funeral and uh, we saw Kathy's uncle Jerry, her dad's brother, and his wife and their pastor. We prayed for 20 years or more for Jerry in North Carolina. He wanted nothing to do with church, nothing to do with God. And somebody, they had a car show or something in the church. They used that to get people in. And one guy just kept after him and kept after him and kept after him. We're going to call him this week. I've been trying to, we kept trying to get a hold of the pastor. And I met the pastor, and they're in church. They got saved. That was a hard one, wasn't it, babe? Amen. It was a hard one. Our nephew, about the same time we prayed for, has been on heroin, in and out of jail. He was such, I'm proud of him because he was a thief, but he was so good at it. He was so good at it, he would just walk. He's young looking, he looked 10 years younger than he was, so polite, and he's robbing somebody's house. And the neighbor said, what are you doing? All they told me, I, got, I could have this TV. And the guy said, well, can I help you? He said, sure. <laughs> got the neighbor over at Lodin. He's, that, he's, that, he's an Allen. He's that good. He robbed like five houses with help. 
And finally, they called him, and he went to jail, two, three, and now he's just walking with God, got saved. Amen. 20 years. His heart wasn't ready then. My brother, Mike, it was older than me, and uh, when we got saved, I, I, I went to the preacher. I said, he, he said, you got to, do, he did to me what I'm doing. You got to witness. If you don't witness and you're saved and you don't witness, his blood will require your hands. You are responsible. You're responsible. Whether you do it or not, God's going to hold you accountable. All you got to do is open your mouth. And give out the gospel. You don't have to be good at it. Just give them the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation. It works. It's, it's, I threw a hand grenade in the army. And we didn't. I never got in the battle. Though I make up stories about Vietnam. To mess with my son who actually went to war in Iran, Iraq. But I threw a hand grenade. And the first one I threw. That's a lot of power in that thing. I saw my drill sergeant get nervous. And so the second one, I threw way further than that first one. <laughs> Kaboom. It is a power of God unto salvation. It's where we get our word dynamite. dynamite. It works. There's a turnover we need. There was something else I was saying before that. I was talking about uh, my nephew. I was talking about your uncle. What was it, honey? You ain't paying a bit of attention. <laughs> She's home cooking chicken. She's home cooking chicken in her mind. Anybody know what I was talking about? What? Well, you, yeah, yeah, no, no. Move it on. We need to witness. We need to witness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we it, it, there's power. I can witness to anybody. Even somebody is not headed as Patrick over there. I see you laughing at me. <laughs> we need to witness. You say, well, I, I, I won't do it. I'm not quite ready. Okay. What do you mean, okay? Okay, you're still going to stand before the judge one day. Anybody ever been in court? Court looks like church, but it ain't. It's anti-church. It don't matter if you're on jury duty or if you're, or if you're the one being tried. It ain't fun. And we shall all, we shall all stand before God and the overriding emotion of the judgment seat of Christ is going to be embarrassment. I didn't know what to do. I told you what to do. I told you what to do. Well, it wasn't for me. Yeah, I said it was for you. Go, to all, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Open your mouth and witness. I got to witness to a, a, a Chinese man on the way back. And he had become an American citizen. And uh, we talked about China and we talked about uh, the gospel. He was saved. He was a deacon in a, in a CMA church, I think, in Tri-Cities, a Chinese church. We had a wonderful talk. Matter of fact, we witnessed to people all around us. My wife was seated uh, up above us, a couple rows up. She said, Said, if I could hear you, I said, good. <laughs> good. <sighs> Secondly, we need not only turnover, we need to get the gospel out. Let people receive it or reject it. That's on God. God said, I just want you to tell them. Serious stuff. How many believe in heaven and hell? I don't believe it just a little bit. I believe it a lot. Right. I absolutely know in my soul after 40 years of salvation, that people are dropping off into hell every single day, and we don't have the love and courage to warn them. Oh, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed. It would embarrass me to keep somebody out of hell. This is real stuff. This comes with the territory. Hallelujah, I've got salvation, yeah, and i got a job to do. Secondly, we need a touch of God. We need the Holy Spirit. I can listen to a preacher. He can have any style in the world. I've heard preachers from here in the Northwest. I've heard preachers from 
from Boston with that wonderful accent. I've heard <laughs> preachers, uh, of course, in the South. I've heard preachers everywhere, everywhere. And, and everybody's different, but there's a commonality. Do we have a touch of God? Is there a sense of realism? Is God real to us? That should be in our prayer life. And when I hear a preacher that, and I've heard some that did not, but when I hear a preacher that has a touch of God on him, it feels like a cool breeze coming through. <laughs> it makes me glad. David said, I was glad. He's glad when there's a turnover. He's glad when there's a touch of God. It's called the presence of God. He's here. He's here. And I don't want to ignore him. We had a lady, this is kind of funny, but we had a lady years ago, a couple years ago, and uh, I was just not in a good frame of mind to talk to people, but she said, I want to meet you and ask to talk to you about the church. I said, okay. And she just wanted these real quiet people. So we talked for a minute. We were sitting outside at one of the coffee shops, and I was just sitting there looking out because she's kind of short anyway, she was. So I'm kind of looking out in the space. I forgot she was there. I forgot she was at the table. And I thought, I should read my Bible here while I'm just sitting here. Because she wasn't saying anything. And I, started, I looked down my Bible. I said, oh, you're still here? <laughs> so we kind of made a joke. Now, this will happen if you come here. I told people, I said, when you see her, I said, act like you're going to shake her hand and go right by her. <laughs> shake somebody. So she laughed at that. And I said, it's good to see you today. I went around and shook somebody else's hand because I, <laughs> I forgot she was at the table. But we do the same thing with God. We, we hit the pause button. Oh, I love you, Jesus. But wait a minute. I got some other stuff to take care of. I got some other stuff to think about. I got some other stuff to enjoy. And we hit the pause button. We pause God. You need to keep a log. People say, I need to keep a diary. Keep a diary of that. When you step away from the presence of God, and we all do it. We don't have to. We shouldn't, but we do. And then you hit the, you hit the reset. A touch of God. You want to be glad? Bring God in here. Get God on you. What, what, what will God, God, God is love. I like love, don't you? I, I, I'm more of a huggy type guy with my wife. She don't really care about it. She'll do it, but she don't care about it. But I like to hug her, kiss her every now and then. I couldn't do it again. I did that one time when I was preaching. Got pretty real, baby. I love her. I, I, I like hugging her. And God likes hugs. God commands us. He tells us in the Bible. And David was a man after God's own heart. And he understood this. You're a great God. Hallelujah, Lord. Give God the glory. You want to be glad? Let God reveal himself to you. That old cold, dried up, dead religion that people embrace every week will not help you. I want to be alive. And we're alive in Christ. 90% of our problems in our personalities, in our homes, would be helped if we'd get glad in Jesus. Amen. God said, I've loved thee with a everlasting love. Why don't you let him love you? My friend Larry Bradford went to see him. His son Jeff is how old is he? Oh, your age or Paul's age? Maybe late 30s, early 40s. And he was talking about Jeff and he said, Jeff, my son cannot tell me that he loves me. And he said he can't hug his mom. You know, it's a personality. And, and it's, it's too emotional for him. So he goes ready to leave. And, and uh, 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 what is her name? Doris. Doris says, Jeff, give mom a hug. He said, Mom, I can't do that. And 
And Larry said, Jeff, give your mom a hug. He said, me and mom have an understanding. <laughs> so when Larry told me that, I said, give me Jeff's number. I called Jeff. I said, Jeff, I love you. And he laughed because he knew his dad had told him. He said, I love you too, but don't tell my dad. <laughs> Take time to love God back. Let God love you. Let him, you got all these burdens. And that's one thing the house of God does. Bear ye one another's burdens. Feels good to talk about stuff. You know, not too detailed now. Can't trust Baptists. You got a burden, a general burden. Why don't you tell somebody? Why don't you share it with somebody? We need a touch of God. I've been in a lot of church services with the touch of God. I don't want nothing else. You can have all that dry orthodoxy and traditions that you want. I want God in his house loving on me. I want to love him back. We need a touch of God, his presence. We need, our faith needs to be tested. Boy, we, we sure do, we sure do get away from God real quick, don't we? When we think God's going to do something and it doesn't work out, whoa, must not have been God. Are you sure about that? Are you 100% sure? Sometimes God makes us wait because he's, he's never doing one thing. It affects a multitude of people. It affects your witness. It affects your testimony. He's doing things. God's testing your faith. Listen, you're, you, I've, I've used this analogy of lifting weights. I know a lot of people talk about me being buff. Tom, you still doing that buff stuff? Tom was just like defined. He was working out. And then he quit. Couldn't catch up with me, I guess. But I can't. I used to could do 10 or 15 push-ups. If I do five push-ups now, it's incredible. Five push-ups, and that last one looks like this. I keep saying, I gotta do something. Gotta get me like a 10 pound bar and start over, I don't know. That's what testing your faith does. You wanna be glad, let God test your faith and grow and get that to that next level? A successful church will make us glad is giving God the glory. I love Brother, Brother Gay he was our song leader and he moved to Montana, which is what a lot of people do when they're distraught. They moved to Montana. Terrible state, terrible place. And he, uh, he, but he would always say his legacy is he'd get done with a song leading. He'd say, give God the glory. Give God the glory. Take a little bit of time. Take as much time thanking God for what he did as Asking him, because I was really nervous about doing my father-in-law's funeral. A lot of pressure. I wanted it to be good. I, a lot of pressure. And God did it. We did it. We did what we were, we were supposed to do. And I've been giving God the glory. I keep telling my wife, flying back, I said, we did it. Got down there, got back. We did it. We did what God wanted us to do, and hopefully somebody is either got saved or is leaning toward salvation. Need to give God the glory. Boy, I'm doing good in my life. Give God the glory. You saved? You didn't do it. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Give God the glory. He did it all. If we meet and we give God the glory instead of ourselves, instead of other people, and we lift him up as being a great God, all-knowing God, ever-present God, 
No mistakes with God. Rules in the chaos. Is your life chaotic? He knows the route to get to you and get you out. He has the answer that you don't have the answer for. That's what made David glad. That's a good church. Going into the house of, of God in Psalm 23, that last verse says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love church. I love church. I love God's people. I love the songs. I love the testimonies. A few years ago, I said, I was trying to say, let's have some testimonies, and the word testimonies come out. I don't know where that came from. But I just assumed how I, I, at least a testimony is something until you get it right. I like testimony. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, I'm going to keep Jesus. I'm not sharing my Jesus. I'm not letting people know I'm excited. I, I'm not letting people know I got the victory. I'll keep that to myself. I pray God just so fill you with the Holy Spirit that you have to scream out the words, Amen! We need turn up. We need a touch of God. We need our faith tested. And we need to give the glory to God.